Hello and good afternoon, Norman. How are you doing today? Good, good. Hey, it's good to uh, be able to tape with you. Man, I'll tell you what, this this is an eye-opener. This is something where you sit back and you you digest every page because you're putting us in a mindset of, of oh, I did not know, and now I want to learn even more. So thank you for this book. Oh, thanks a lot. War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of the Military Machine. I, I, I never, how did you even get introduced to such an idea? Well, it was sort of hidden in plain sight. I began to think about what is it about the U.S. wars that I'm not realizing like a fish in water, forgetting what the water is. And it gradually dawned on me and Really, the first words I wrote of this book were the title, War Made Invisible, (laughs) that we don't know what we don't realize, and we don't realize what we don't know, because the media messaging is so much about silence. Mm -hmm. It's not only that the victims of war who are at the other end of U.S. firepower are almost never presented as real human beings— But also there's just this sort of white noise that prevents us from even grasping what's being done with war in our tax dollars, in our names. You know, it's really interesting, Norman, since since reading the book and really diving into it, I look at the headlines much differently now. I mean, because you start looking at Syria, you start looking at these smaller countries and stuff, and and right away you're going, wait a second, Norman is on to something here. I think we've all if we have traveled to another country, quite often anyway, we've read about the country, maybe we've seen some photographs, we have an image, but at best it's going to be a two-dimensional image. And then we go there and we can make some kind of human connection and we realize that we're all part of a deeper and broader human family. That gap between media coverage And what is really going on with human beings on the ground somewhere else is so magnified. It's such a huge gap in terms of coverage of war and the absence of coverage. If people don't seem human to us, Mm -hmm. why should we care about them? Why should we care that the Pentagon is perhaps killing civilians in that country. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, what, what's really interesting, listeners need to know about this, is that uh, that you're talking about politicians as well as the media in this book. So it's not taking someone's side. I mean, you're, you're going after the entire picture. Oh, absolutely. And it's also a bipartisan problem, as we've seen, mm-hmm. the voting of record high Pentagon budgets. It's Republicans and Democrats lining up to do that. And by the same token, News media, journalists, the press, and the First Amendment is supposed to be a watchdog, but really when it comes to the war making of this country, so often it's more like a lapdog. And we have, in a sense, a fourth branch of government, which is corporate dominated media that very rarely challenges the underlying mm-hmm. rationales for going to war. You know, there can be arguments on cable news or whatever about. Should the United States go to war here or there or when or how? But it's very difficult to find a challenge to the prerogative of the United States to go and bomb other countries just because some people in Washington decide that's okay. And so we have this sort of double standard going on where understandably and properly we're condemning, and we should, Russia for invading and making war on Ukraine. But a lot of the same politicians and pundits in the mass media who are rightfully condemning Russia for what it's doing in Ukraine were cheering on what the United States did in Iraq. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll tell you what, you're probably going to think I'm insane on this, but I just think it's very weird how Afghanistan comes to an end in the United States and all of a sudden Russia invades Ukraine. It's like, hold on, wait a second here. And and it, I can't imagine how much money is transferring through the hands of so many people that aren't in the war, but they're making the weapons. Well, unfortunately, war is so lucrative, and it's one of the motor engines of the war machine. I have a chapter in the book, uh, Costs of War, and we can look at costs in two major ways. One is the human costs, 
not only in terms of the economics of the money that's being bled out of our country, so to speak, for health care, education, housing to fund the Pentagon, uh, but also the way in which the financial costs uh, are combined with the, the human costs the, that you can't put a price tag on. Yeah. Uh, not only that we're missing health care, education, housing in our own country and so forth because of the boondoggle to the Pentagon, but also we have the PTSD, the mm. wounded veterans who come home, the loved ones who will grieve forever. That needs to be talked about as well as those who suffer at the end, at the other end of U.S. military firepower. Mm. I, I got to ask you, Norman, is the U.S. invisibly at war with itself? In a sense, I think that we've become our own enemy yeah. because after 9-11, we stopped asking, when will this war end? It has come to seem that the war will be ongoing and nobody really talks about when it might end. And not only is the United States in search of enemies, and by the way, the so-called war on terror has created more rather than less enemies for the U.S. around the world. But in a sense, the U.S. has become its own enemy, like in the old Pogo comic strip, I've met the enemy and he is us. Yeah. We're undermining ourselves, and that's what the warfare state does. And that's why I think visualizing and coming to terms with this warfare state we live in is so important. Again, that's why I came back to the title, War Made Invisible. As long as these wars and the warfare state are invisible, we can't turn this around. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's got to also include the one thing that people have become numb to is that uh, I remember growing up, if you ever questioned the honesty of the government, then the, the, you were going against the United States of America. Nowadays, oh, my God, everybody's doing it. They're, they're questioning every single move, and it's like we've become numb. Well, we have become numbed, I think, in, in the war context to the effects of war. Yeah. And even while there's a lot of uh, political sniping and so forth and second guessing and should uh, the U.S. be engaged more or less in a particular theater of war somewhere in the country, I believe, and, and the book really, I think, makes the case that we are numbed to the effects of war. And so there might be a lot of questioning of government conduct, but the underlying right or prerogative of the U.S. to actually be a rather brutal policeman, mm -hmm. be the policeman for the world, that gets very little challenge in the halls of Congress or in the big mass Sweet. media outlets. And I think we need a lot more debate and a lot less conformity. Yeah, yeah. I got I got to issue a challenge to my listeners. When you sit down with this book, War Made Invisible, have a highlighter in your hand because I want to sit down and compare notes with people on, on, on what they're learning and how they're going to activate their own their own steps after they read this book. I mean, Norman, this I, you're spot on. You're spot on, dude, and I can't thank you enough for this book. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the chance to speak with you and your audience. Well, you come back to this show anytime you want to, Norman. The door's always going to be open for you, okay? I'd love to. Thanks so much.